I'm here today with Christian Bellabed and Thomas Theobald, um, who are both doctoral students um, working at the Macroeconomic Policy Institute in Germany. And they're working on this project um, with a professor there, Till van Trieck, um, and another graduate student who's not here today, um, Jan Beringer. A very, very interesting project um, uh, called Income Inequality, Household Debt, and Current Account Imbalances. Um, welcome. Um, Christian, let me start with you. Um, this link of, you know, this idea to link income inequality with current account imbalances um, is intriguing to me. It's sort of improbable uh, uh, connection, um, but you make, a, you make a good case that there seems to be some link in the data about this. Um, and uh, I, how did you come to see this link? Well, let me first mention that we have, um, that we build on the work that uh, our principal investigator Till van Trieck and Simon Sturen have done before. Now we try to formalize what they have found, um, which is basically building models um, to uh, actually show that there can be a channel between inequality so and current account imbalances. So they found this empirical kind of association, uh, which, which is sort of puzzling, because one is sort of microeconomic and one is macroeconomic or something. Mm. And so now the question is, what could be the channels? What could be the, the causation, uh, the links? Yeah, uh, uh, well, for one, um, there are two possible channels. that channels that we see from the data. The first is uh, coming from the functional income distribution, which is basically, say, a decline in the wage share that we have observed in most of industrial economies in the last 30 years. One coming from the personal income distribution, that's the rise in top income shares. So what we do is we employ uh, a consumption theory that has, some, has been somewhat neglected in the last 30, 40 years, which is the relative income hypothesis, which states that people's consumption preferences are interdependent. That means if you have a rise in top income shares, people just below this top income share start catching up, start keeping up. So what they face is a trade-off. Either go to a better neighborhood, send their, their, their uh, kids to a better school, or face a psychologically painful loss of status compared to the, mm -hmm. to the group that now, has experienced the top income this share. This relative income hypothesis um, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, was first proposed by Jim Dusenberry um, back in 1949. Um, and it was beaten out by the uh, permanent income hypothesis and life cycle uh, exactly. theories and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, but you're bringing it back in as a way mm -hmm. of, an, and so let me just understand how this works. The idea is that people are modeling their consumption behavior on the consumption of people around them or the people that they see, the people that they, they connect to. And so if, if, if you're consuming more, I feel like I have to consume more, even if my income hasn't gone up. That's the idea. That's the idea. And so how do I do that? Well, basically, you have two options. Yeah. Draw down your savings and or increase debt. So basically, take up credit from whatever bank is willing to lend to you. And this will then eventually cause some sort of regime where you experience current account deficits. For instance, that, that would be the case in the US, where you have. If you're borrowing from abroad, you're saying. If you're also borrowing from abroad, exactly. Uh -huh. um, basically. The U.S. are very, very special case because you, you face a low or even no credit constraints for households. So you have what Robert Frank has called uh, the expenditure cascades, starting at the very top of the income mm. distribution, going down the whole personal income distribution because people can borrow. Mm -hmm. Now, and Thomas, I want to bring you in on this. Yes. yes, you've been wanting to chime yeah. in. Actually, we are proposing some extended version of the relative income hypothesis. So we are concentrating on institutional factors where um, we think people can see that it is important for them to uh, orient uh, uh, at some reference group. For example, the, the, the private school system in the US seems to be a good example for us. You really have um, uh, the fear when you don't send your children to the best private school that they uh, don't have this future perspective they need. So uh, with the rich guys, um, making this uh, pressure out of uh, the middle class also to send their uh, uh, children to the private schools. We have w one um, maybe intuitive example where the relative income hypothesis seems to be more uh, appropriate than the, what is still prevailing with the permanent income hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, you mentioned that this is specific to the US and also the, the availability of credit and so forth. True. One of the interesting things about this project mm -hmm is that you're, you're thinking that this relative income hypothesis, although maybe it is a general theory of consumption, may play out differently 
in different countries. And in particular, you talk about uh, why Germany, Germany and China as counterexamples, maybe not counterexamples that show that the theory is wrong, okay, but that the way it plays out is, is different. One important reference paper for us is, is what uh, Michael Kumhoff and co-authors did. And um, they explained uh, China via the underdeveloped financial markets. Um, while you have in both countries, in the US and China, they are only concerning US and China, um, an increase in top income shares. But in Germany, you have a highly developed financial market and you also see the increase in inequality measures. But, um, and there come our two missing pieces into the game. Um, you also have to include the functional um, income distribution and this is the, 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 the one piece we are bringing in, include both distributions and you don't see at the top end this dramatic increase in Germany. And um, the other thing is um, that institutions, as we said, play a big role. For example, in Germany we have a highly uh, specific labor market where you have high firm skills, very specific firm skills. So when you think of something starts in the second half of the distribution, the middle class uh, uh, gets fear um, and um, uh, this, this may, may, may um, um, arise in um, uh, precautionary savings so like Carlin and Soskic. Um, because, skills, because skills are so industry specific, very specific you're afraid yeah. that, that you know, economic change could make you unemployed. That's true. I see. That's true. And so that instead of keeping up with the Joneses, right. okay, as as Duesenberry said, you you say I, I I'm imagining a future self of mine, okay, who is unemployed. Yeah, and this I need to take care of that and protect that. Yeah. In this case, uh, yeah. uh, it's it's running the the other way around. It's like uh. that you get a negative um, um, contribution from the relative income term you are adding to your consumption function. This whole uh, revival of the relative income hypothesis is, seems to me in a certain way, a revival of a connection between economics and social psychology, for example. True. I know Duesenberry was in fact connected to the, the psychology and social relations department initially when he mm -hmm. came to Harvard. Um, that was 50 years ago, okay. And so are there any people from, with that background in your project or are they just economists or? Well, we are all just economists. So you're trying to bring in more realism of, That's true. of, of, uh, of the way people actually yep. behave. Well, in the end, economics is still a social science. Yes. Um, so even if we draw upon mathematics and building mathematical models, so <laughs> conducting a lot of equations, we still have to um, make sure that this is somewhat represented by what we observe in reality. And mm -hmm. this is uh, very important for our model. And as you go back to the classics, I mean, if you read, for instance, Veblen, uh, conspicuous consumption is um, a very old thought. They have never um, wrote down an equa equation in their books. So mm -hmm. this is uh, basically uh, some sort of new economic thinking by revival of mm -hmm. economic thinking as it was before, as including psychological, mm -hmm. social factors. Now I'm interested in how you're, there's four people on this project and three of you are PhD students and then your professor, but how, does you, how do you actually divide up the work or who does what and how do you coordinate? Do you meet once a week or how does it actually work? Basically we meet, yeah, technically speaking we meet once a week, every second week. Um, Jan is uh, our specialist for um, the uh, empirical, for the econometrics. Um, I'm doing the uh, stock flow consistent model Thomas is doing the agent-based DSG model, and uh, Till is, so to speak, our um, coordinator. Sort of coordinator, our guiding angel. But you all came from other universities, mm -hmm. so you're all attracted by this project or by this supervisor uh, and the opportunity to work on this thing together. Um, that's interesting. I don't think we have that kind of mechanism would be possible in the United States. Yeah, in Germany you can yeah. do it when you are belonging to this macroeconomic policy institute. You are spending a lot of time there and not at the university. So mm -hmm. we have the time to meet and to coordinate our work. It provides a very flexible way of uh, working. 
Now, you mentioned your third, the third student who's the specialist in stock flow consistent. So I've been looking at the history of this grant, and I see that the first proposal was only for doing this all in a DSGE mm -hmm. framework. And then because of some of the referee comments, you said, well, we're going now to be comparing. We're going <coughs> to also be doing stock flow consistent and, uh, and agent based. And because, of course, the microeconomics of this, you know, does not, you know, how you close the model is not implied by the relative income hypothesis. So you're, that's an interesting sort of response to bring, and I guess that meant bringing on this additional, this additional person to, to do that. And then you're going to be comparing these two macroeconomic sort of uh, uh, embedding this relative income hypothesis in these two macroeconomic structures and comparing that. That's quite interesting. Well, that's, that is interesting. You're right. Um, it would also strengthen our case and our argument if we can do this in a more supply-side oriented world, which would be the DSG world, or in a more demand-side oriented world, which, which would be the uh, stock flow consistent world. Um, so we'll go back to this idea that you're just economists. So you, you started, <laughs> I'm interested in how you got to this, uh, you know, the courage to do some new economic thinking or the, the interest in doing it. Um, and stepping out and not just doing what everyone else is, is doing. I would say the, the Macroeconomic Policy Institute has a special role in Germany because uh, at the universities um, it's rather mainstream economics what you learn in other undergraduate um, uh, lessons but I mean we all experienced the financial crisis we all saw when all these models failed so um, this was uh, the incentive when you are just starting your PhD then to rethink um, what, what has been there before. I still remember when I finished my diploma thesis in Linz, I, I, I somehow stumbled over um, the work done by Piketty, Seiss, Atkinson with the top income database. Mm -hmm. And I saw this, um, this graph, um, the top income shares for the, for the US from 19, uh, I don't know, 20 on, so uh, covering the Great Depression, covering the so-called Keynesian age, and then the 80s with the whole shift in policy and everything. Um, and this is when I got actually hooked up with the topic of income inequality. And then, uh, in correspondence with the crisis uh, going wild on the world, in the world, um, basically the link between inequality and what is going on in the real world was very, very appealing and interesting. Well, I think it's a wonderful project. I'm really, I can see why our referees decided to support this. And I'm really very much looking forward to seeing uh, the output of all of this. But meanwhile, I'm happy to welcome you to our stable of INET economists. Thank you. Thank you.